welcome everybody. It's time once again for another episode of Driven by Design. The one show, maybe the only show that shows you the future of car design and where we're all headed. One conversation at a time. With the man who loves to talk about all the future, that's where he lives, Brian Thompson. Welcome, sir. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon here in this space I'm in. Who knows where it is where you're watching, but thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we actually have a really interesting guest today coming straight out of Mazda and looking towards the future of electrification of automobiles. Ali Jahed, uh, I'm going to spell your name, Ali, because I, I want to say Jawa, because I think it's, it's like the closest thing I can pronounce to Jawa. That's kind of how it's pronounced, but it's actually J-A-H-E-D. Ali, welcome to the show. Right on. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, it's, as my grandpa would say, it's great to be had. The things I, I want to give people a little background about what you do is, uh, Ali, you worked at Mazda for many years. Mazda is close to my heart. My design mentor who taught me automotive design, Tom Otano, created the Miata. Great so time. I love Mazda. You are now, you were part of Mazda's uh, electrification of their vehicle program, meaning coming into a space as uh, a late, latecomer to the space in terms of electrification but in the, only, in the way that only Mazda could do it with enthusiasm to keep the car fun to drive. And going forward, you now have your own consultancy and you are working on this concept of on a broader scale, helping companies to electrify the, the thing that we call the automobile. Uh, did I get that right? That's right. That's right, man. You got it right. Excellent. Tell us a bit about what you learned at Mazda. Let me preface my question in this sense. What I have found is that all the guys that go through Mazda, whether it's Tom or Derek Jenkins or Franz von Holzhausen, you know, especially in design, they all come out the other end as uh, either they either go in as enthusiasts, which may be why they go to Mazda, but they come out with a different perspective than anybody else in the industry. And it's this. It always feels like they're keeping the heart and the soul of the funness of a car to drive. Right. You know, Miata is that heart. But even a Mazda's minivan is fun to drive. And I feel like that's, it's a great place to do your tenure, if you will, in the automotive industry because you come out of the other end. How are you infusing – rather, the question is, what did you learn at Mazda that you're taking forward? Uh, that's a great question, Brian. Um, and you said a lot of right things about Mazda. I think the percentage-wise, there's more car enthusiasts at Mazda. And I think that's really what the industry lacks because car enthusiasts, I mean, they've been studying the industry and the product before they come into their position. So – and with Mazda being uh, almost like a small, big company, uh, there's a lot of exposure to executives, the other you know, different areas of the business. So it's a great learning opportunity as well that maybe um, it wouldn't exist at a larger uh, company. So you get to learn about product. You get to interact on the business planning side. And I think you know, being an enthusiast at a company that's focused on driving dynamics, like you mentioned, even the MPV or even a CX-9 large vehicle, but you know, the driving feels very engaging. So um, it, is in, it is intentional. There's a lot of passionate car people at Mazda, you know, on the R&D side, especially, you know, they're all car enthusiasts. They're all trying to improve their driving, mm-hmm. field, suspension tuning. So I think like you mentioned, you know, when you go in as an enthusiast, you probably absorb a lot more than if you were just going in for a business or an engineering position. So as a car guy, you, you kind of learn more from that experience. And then moving forward, you kind of it kind of builds you up a little bit more. So when you're kind of doing your next phase, um, you know, you bring more to the table because of that experience. Yeah. You bring up a great point. I think that there are, there are certain car companies that are, that are unique in the industry. And I would, I would say companies like Mazda, Nissan, Citroen in France, you know, um, you know, it, it's where um, in a lot of car companies, you are very uh, pigeonholed into a role. And I feel like these other sort of kind of scrappy car companies, if I can call them that, you, you're sort of a jack of all trades. You can and have to do everything, which is what I loved about you know my time at Nissan or Citroën in the, in the way, way past, like a long time ago. You And I think what it does is it fosters or it attracts and then fosters an entrepreneurial mentality, which makes sense that you would then, after your time at Mazda, go on and stay in this wonderful industry of car. Tell us about what your passion is for the car industry. You are clearly an enthusiast. I can tell by the race car and the, and the motorbike behind you. Tell me about it. Put it this way. I've loved cars since I was a kid. I was, I had subscriptions to car and driver, road and track, motor trend back when I was in junior high. So, you know, by the time I graduated high school, I'd been, you know, learning about cars for six plus years and, 
you know, growing up in Southern California, the, the tuning market was just huge. I mean, you know, we didn't have VH to tune in my era. It was mostly four-cylinder Hondas and Nissan Sentra SCRs that you probably remember the, the first version especially. So yeah, I grew up playing with cars, you know, learning how to tune cars from there. I mean, I always knew I wanted to work in the car industry. So I initially worked in the aftermarket with customization and mm-hmm. performance tuning. Um, you know, I also love motorcycles. So I'm like a... I just love engines, man. Uh, they're almost mm-hmm. like mechanical watches to me, right? Even in the era of electrification, those are all like smart watches. But you know, there's a certain person that has an appreciation for the mechanical watch because of the precision movement and the precision parts. And you know, that's kind of the same attraction I have for high performance engines and vehicles. Yeah, you know, and it's an interesting thing because I, I want to really hear your thoughts about where the industry is going. Because, you know, oftentimes the, you know, I, I work a lot on self-driving cars right now. And what I, and the feedback I'll get if somebody hears about that is often, oh, it's going to be a future where we ride around like Wally and there's nothing to do. And it's like, it couldn't be further from this truth, but I want to hear your perspective. What's the in world of enthusiasm for automobiles going to be like in about 10, 20 years from now? You know, that's actually a great question as well. It's like, if there is enough enthusiasts down the road, because I feel like the enthusiast base has kind of changed, right? So if let's mm-hmm. say the future of car enthusiasts exists, I think you can still have fun. You just, you just can't do much engine tuning, but suspension tuning, you know, customization and styling, wheels. I mean, those are all open to make your you know, individual car. And I'm sure, you know, there'll be performance, you know, uh, track only vehicles that enthusiasts can enjoy. Um, but I mean, it is changing and, you know, a self-driving vehicles, I definitely see there's a need, especially for ride hailing, ride sharing. I mean, there's some mm-hmm. people that don't really enjoy driving and, you know, living in Orange County, there's so much traffic that there, there's just limited time to enjoy a nice quick vehicle to begin with. You have to head out, you know, on a 6 a.m., 7 a.m. drive to have an open road to enjoy a quick car. So I also understand why, you know, especially in, you know, major urban markets where maybe it's more difficult to be a car enthusiast uh, because of traffic. Uh, and I think self-driving cars definitely have their piece in, in you know, future mobility. So I don't have an issue with, I think. Yeah. That- and you bring up a good point there. It, it, you know, what you're, it's, you're it's saying, if I may translate to, into my ears, sounds like there's a real difference between commuting and driving. And commuting is like something where, you know, I've got meetings to do. I need to be there, but I'm going there and I, Leave the driving to the robot, right? Because they're actually better at it than a lot of humans who are watching the Kardashians and getting distracted and having road rage, right? Okay. So, like, there's that kind of right. But the driving part, I'll tell you what. Like, I, I a friend of mine, David Hilton, runs uh, the new Fisker incarnation of that company, and I was in the the new iteration of that car. When he punched it, man, I, I thought Tesla was fast. That thing threw me back so oh, wow. fast. I was like, I, I'm over there, but I'm my body's still here. You know, like That's it was. Right really exciting and i wonder you know if my generation i think you're a little younger than me we wouldn't understand the concept of tuning on an electric car because we see that as an appliance but this younger generation who have grown up around this stuff i bet they'll have a total different view of what it means to tune an electric vehicle that's a great point maybe it would be cooling the battery pack or putting in different stronger motors and doing Mm -hmm. software uh with a battery management system and all that, but you're right. I think the tuning will be around, but like you said, just the definition of it will change, especially for powertrain. It's just going to be a little bit different, but you know, just be a different uh, version of it for the future. Yeah. And then the world that it lives in is changing. One of the questions I get a lot, um, you know, for people around me seeing these cars starting to appear is, is how are we going to charge them all? How are, what's the infrastructure going to be? And and because my part of it is really focused on the thing, I designed the car, right? I'd love to hear from you, somebody who works more with the holistic environment. How is that going to evolve? Are we going to see retrofit gas stations? Are, how are we going to support these cars? Because they're they're sort of like, do you remember that old ad in the late seven, early 70s when all the Japanese cars were coming and the American car companies were afraid? And they sort of were like, pictured them as like these little bugs coming from all over. That's well, right. they're coming, you know, yeah, like yeah. What, what's going to be here when they get here? Well, uh, a great point about uh, charging structure, because that's one of the, I guess, customer anxieties or pain points about, you know, buying electric vehicles is how am I going to charge this vehicle? So you know, there needs to be almost like a, uh, 
cohesive collective effort to get to that goal that they have in the future, 2030 or 2035, because I think right now there's about 100,000 charging points. <clears throat> and if every vehicle sold is going to be electric, that's definitely not enough. So uh, building codes should be changed. So, you know, multi-unit dwellings, they have access to level two chargers so they can do overnight charging because, you know, the best customer experience with EV ownership is having a level two charger at home or, you know, in your apartment complex or in a parking garage. So you can just do overnight charging where the rates are low and you're doing slow charging. So you're not really affecting battery life. You're not putting a lot of heat into it. So to get that level two charger for people at home and getting them into the habit of, you know, the same way that they get home and charge their phone, you just get home and plug in your vehicle. And then for public charging, like you said, gas stations, they'll probably just replace some of those tanks with, you know, giant battery packs and they'll just put, you know, fast charging stations because gas stations are already in locations that there's a lot of high traffic. And, you know, once electrification hits, people's driving habits and their work location is not really going to change. They're still going to shop the same way and drive the same route. So I think gas stations, like you said, it's the ideal location for fast chargers in the future. And then having level two charging at home or at the office, um, that, that's really the best customer solution. And so there's just <clears throat> so much to be done to get to that level where there's fast chargers out there, like, you know, every gas station around the corner. So Yeah. So, so infrastructure is changing, adapting. A lot of it's going to come into your home, your personal space, public space. Um, one of the things I'd, I'd love for you to share with our viewers, uh, and, and please understand, I'm never asking you to share anything confidential, but perform this in the way that you can. So one of the things that I think is challenging for an automotive, a pre-existing OEM, a large company that has a reputation, is a lot of their branding is based on an experience. The experience of driving or owning a Honda is very different than driving a BMW, right, or a Lamborghini, or a Datsun, you know, if you're going overseas to like, you know, where the, the, the emerging markets where Datsun still exists. What would keep somebody coming to Mazda if the Mazda drives itself when so much of what makes a Mazda is that zoom, zoom feeling? Can you give us a little insight? And if you need to put it in general terms, that's fine too. But sure. how do you give the <clears throat> consumer something Mazda-esque if they're no longer driving it? And another great question, uh, Ryan. Um, so I think Mazda being a smaller manufacturer, they can still kind of focus on the driving experience, but they also understood that that is going to change down the road in a self-driving EV world where, um, you know, driving experience isn't really part of the customer requisite for, for purchasing new vehicles. So then it becomes quality design, as you know, I mean, design. design. It's such an important you know, part of it, and it's almost like any type of consumer good, right? So design becomes an important part, and <clears throat> you saw probably over the last five years, Mazda put a lot of effort into design. Design was such an important thing, and you know, they're really working to kind of move up market, maybe to around where Acura is, to have really good quality products and match it with mm-hmm. really good customer experience. And um, in the future, you know, infotainment, the in-vehicle experience, I, I think that's mm-hmm. going to be a challenge for the traditional OEMs. Um, where maybe the, the new players into the market, like the Apple car or, you know, some of the right. future vehicles coming out, they're all about customer experience and infotainment. So it's easy <laughs> to kind of bring it, you know, it, it, yeah. the customer in their vehicle. I, I can see where I can visualize, as a designer, I can kind of visualize what you're saying, which help this, like, kind of give this to our, our viewers and then we'll sort of wrap up and tell people how to find you. So I always think of Mazda as a bit mischievous, right? Like, you know, Mazda is the one you jump into Mazda and you're like, the driver's like, you better hold on because we're right. going to take this curve a little faster than maybe we should. I could imagine a Mazda being like, all right, if you want to be in the Mazda mode, time to put on your strap and hold on to your seat, baby, because I'm going to drive you a little faster. Like, I like that the car can still have its personality, even if you're not exactly driving it as much anymore. Right. Ali, uh, do let people know how they can find you as a consultant. Uh, they, you know, I'm sure you have clients of all different scales from big car companies to you know startups. Uh, you have an amazingly valuable service that you offer uh, looking forward, looking backwards. How do they find you? Well, the website for my business is uh, moromobility.com. It's uh, M-O-R-R-O-W, mobility.com. And you can also reach out to me by email. My email address is J at fastmail.com. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on, Ali. This is a great look at the future. I, you know, as a Mazda enthusiast, this has been delightful. So thank you very much. Of course, Brian. Thanks for having me on. I can tell you're a car guy yourself. So it's a, it's a <laughs> yeah, pleasure talking to you. Right on. <laughs>
Well, there you have it. A couple of car guys talking cars here on the only show where we tell you where things are going. Driven by design right here on Orange County's only community radio station. OCTalkRadio.net.